summer can be a bit of a slog. For us, it's often for some reason a rather busy time, and I'm sure we're not alone. Well, you can beat the summertime sadness and the August angst and enhance your everyday with our excellent sponsor, Via Hemp. This is a company that crafts award-winning premium THC and THC-free gummies. Each of these gummies is especially designed to cultivate a specific mood. Whether you're looking to get relaxed, get quality sleep, get creative, or just to get focused. If you're 21 or older, you can experience it for yourself and get 15% off your first order with our exclusive code MSHEET at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. I personally enjoyed their grapefruit flow state gummies. This CBG and CBD powerhouse really helped me tap into my productivity. Like, we have had an extremely busy summer, and I feel Flow State got me over the finish line a few times. When I was editing multiple episodes a day, digging through documents, and knocking out a bunch of interviews. Biohemp does not require a medical card, and it ships legally to all 50 states. It's also affordable, and even more so for Murder Sheet listeners who get a special deal. If you're 21 and older, head to viahemp.com and use code MSHEET to receive 15% off. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P dot com and use code MSHEET at checkout. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Enhance your everyday with Via. Temp check. What kind of summer are we having this year? A family road trip summer, a beach bum summer, or a wake me up when the sun sets summer? With Instacart, choose your own adventure and skip the shopping side quests. Where available, you can get ice cream delivered to your hotel, sunscreen to the pool, or cold brew to your bed. Well, door, in as fast as 30 minutes. Wherever you find yourself this summer, you can get the goods. Download Instacart for free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Excludes restaurants. Additional terms and fees apply. Okay, it's time to commit. 2024 is the year for prioritizing yourself. Begin your new smile journey with Byte, and you could start seeing results in just two to three weeks. Just order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Byte clear liners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces, plus they offer financing options, accept eligible insurance, and you could pay with your HSA, FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Content warning. This episode includes discussion of the murder of children. So, occasionally, in the Delphi case, we get so many questions of one type or another that we decide to just stop everything and do a quick questions episode, sort of a way to engage with our listeners who may wonder, hey, what's going on with this? Or what are your thoughts on this or that? So this is going to be one of those episodes. We'll be compiling some of the most common questions we've gotten on Delphi recently and trying to answer those to the best of our ability. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders, questions and answers for February 2024. So one question we get a lot is what the heck is going on in the Mitch Westerman case? Mitch Westerman, of course, is the former employee of defense attorney Andrew Baldwin, who says that he surreptitiously took photos of 
discovery materials that were on uh, the table in a conference room at Andy Baldwin's law office and then subsequently shared them with at least one member of the public. Since then, he has been charged with criminal conversion. So the most recent thing going on there is that Westerman's defense attorneys have filed a motion to dismiss. Now, there's lots of reasons you can file a motion to dismiss. We just saw one filed in the Richard Allen case where the defense attorneys argued that this needs to be dismissed because the prosecution didn't play fair. They didn't give us some evidence they should have given us, or they destroyed evidence that we needed in order to present our case. That's not the basis of the argument that Westerman's attorney is making. So this argument is actually based on their reading of the law. Does the law apply to this case? What they're saying is that everything in the PCA against Westerman could be true potentially, but it still doesn't rise to the level of a misdemeanor, doesn't rise to the level of a broken law. So that's essentially what they're saying. Yes. They're contesting the definition of criminal conversion. Or, 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 they're, they're arguing that the definition of criminal conversion doesn't match with ha- what happened here. Right. In order to be successfully convicted of criminal conversion, you need to show that an individual knowingly and or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over property. And in this case, over property that belonged to attorney Andy Baldwin. And they're saying... We don't believe this meets that standard. So we're going to go through this document and present their arguments. We're not, to be clear, we're not saying we agree or disagree with these arguments. We're just trying to explain the arguments as we understand them. And I would imagine at some point there's going to be a response filed by the prosecutor. Explaining their side of it. The two factors they are focusing on are, number one, did Westerman exert unauthorized control over something? And and number two, was this property actually owned by Andrew Baldwin? And they quote from the Indiana Code, which uh, defines exerting control over property as obtaining, taking, carrying, driving, leading away, concealing, abandoning, selling, conveying, encumbering, or possessing property or securing, transferring, or extending a right to property. Okay. So they're saying this doesn't match any of those. They're saying all he did was take pictures. And that when you take a picture of something, according to them, that's not the same as exerting control over it. Right. Okay. So... We always have analogies and stuff on our show. They put some analogies in their uh, document. Love a good analogy. So here's one analogy or comparison. There are numerous examples of analogous behavior that are obviously not conversion. For example, if an individual goes to a museum and takes a picture of a painting with a no photo sign next to it, has that person committed a conversion? Of course not. If someone takes a photo over their neighbor's fence of a flower of the flower garden, have they converted their neighbor's flowers? Again, of course not. And then they say, like, obviously it's different if the museum patron steals the painting or takes it away, takes it off the wall and does something else with it. Yeah, so they're they're making the claim that just taking a picture doesn't count as unauthorized control. And this is certainly something we have heard this argument from other criminal defense attorneys who we've discussed this case with. That's true. And that's it's not surprising. It it makes sense. Maybe he's already signed an affidavit saying that, you know, what he did. So it's a bit hard to put that rabbit back in the hat. But you can say, listen, it just maybe we can find it morally dubious, but we don't it's not legally problematic. And then the other issue they're discussing is, was this property belonging to Andy Baldwin? In other words, were these images the property of Andrew Baldwin? And they're arguing that it's not. The, it, the images were not copyrighted or trademarked. And most, perhaps, if they were printed on paper, maybe Baldwin owned the paper. That's very lawyerly. I, I think, to me, the first point makes a lot of sense because you're saying the conversion doesn't fit what happened here. And they have some good analogies. They have some good descriptions of that. 
the idea that Baldwin doesn't have some ownership of crime scene photos in a case where he's defending somebody just seems a bit well, well, there's, odd. They're, they're making the argument that the, the, if there's an ownership interest, it's owned by the state uh, because other lawyers can see these images. They're not copyrighted or trademarked. Uh, they make an interesting comparison. They, they, they compare it to many times when you work in an office, you use a, a common piece of software and you have a software license. And so what if a former employee of a firm continues to use the license to use the software after he leaves the firm? They, they, they make the argument here that if doing so does not deprive anyone at the firm of the use of the software. This almost got them kicked off the case. And also what we've been led to understand from some filings I remember from Nicholas McClellan, the Carroll County prosecutor, is that early on the prosecution identified these images as having come from the defense because there was some side-by-side element to it. So whatever he took photos of seemingly was at the very least altered by the defense team in order to, you know, whatever they were trying to do with them. It's it's not it's not clear to me that they ha- didn't, you know, do something themselves with them for their internal use. And so you you could argue that they belong to Baldwin in that sense because it's not it's not the raw stuff from discovery. It's something he did. So it's an interesting point. An interesting argument, just presenting the arguments uh, is they are in those documents. Those are the key elements. So we'll anticipate some sort of response from the prosecution and we'll see if the um, motion to dismiss the case is successful. So now let's talk about something that, you know, caused a, a little bit of a stir, I think, in the in the Delphi space recently. And that was a recent interview on Court TV featuring Court TV journalist Barbara McDonald. And this was when she was speaking with an anchor named Julie Grant. And they were talking about evidence against Richard Allen. Don't you have a transcript of what exactly Ms. McDonald said? I do. But first, let me preface that this touched upon something that got a lot of people talking because it really had to do with, I think, forensics and the integrity of the investigation itself. Even though it was sort of offhandedly mentioned, it definitely had a big impact. So I wanted to talk about that. But first, so we can understand what we're talking about, let's read a quick transcript from that discussion. So I'm reading quotes from, again, Miss McDonald. And specifically, they're talking about, quote, the 40 caliber bullet, the unspent round that was found between the bodies. And my understanding is that discovery was made some days after the murders. So when the bodies were found on the 14th of February, seven years ago tomorrow now, they did secure that crime scene for about three days. And they searched it. And then they cleared it for about a day, day and a half. And then they resecured it. My understanding is that unspent shell was discovered during that second search after the scene had been resecured and it was found under the dirt. It wasn't just laying out in the open. It had been somewhat buried, whether intentionally or through time and the elements, we don't know. But that is the bullet that they're saying was ejected or cycled through his pistol. Okay, so let's be clear. It's often been stated that the key piece of evidence against Richard Allen is this bullet discovered at the crime scene, which links his gun and therefore him to the crime scene. And needless to say, if the bullet was discovered several days later, after the crime scene had been cleared and presumably other people had access to the area, the evidence would be much, much less compelling. It would be pretty much close to worthless if that was the case. Yes. This episode is sponsored by Auto Trader. Credit scores, down payments, interest rates, car buying can be a numbers game, but you don't have to be a math expert to get the keys to your dream car. Just use Kelly Blue Book My Wallet on Auto Trader. Crunch your numbers and get your personalized results so you know exactly how much you'll pay each month for your car. It's like having a magic wand for your wallet. Presto, the car you've been wanting is now within reach. So hit the road and leave your calculator at home. Find your next car on autotrader.com. 
What makes a life a good one? Is it the adventure you have? Or the friends you find along the way? Maybe it's pursuing your passion while striving to protect, defend, and save what you believe in every single day. So, what makes a life a good one? In the Coast Guard, we think it's all of the above and more. But you'll have to find out for yourself. Visit GoCoastGuard.com to learn more. So, this is very, very important. It's a pretty big detail to just throw out there. And I would... uh I would, frankly, if this was true, I would have expected the defense attorneys to mention it in one of their many filings on the case. Why don't we talk about some of those filings to maybe get into what they did say about the bullet? Okay. Because, again, um, I think we'll we'll talk about some of the, the, the quibbles and the issues that they have raised with the bullet. So this is from the Franks memorandum, this, this sentence. Additionally, allegedly... Bef- Allegedly found between the two girls buried under leaves and dirt was a single bullet. Again, something from the Franks memorandum. Also, the defense has provided three photos of a bullet purportedly found in the ground between Abby and Libby and marked these photos as exhibit 23, as exhibits 23, 24 and 25. And this one is also from the Franks memorandum. It should be noted that as of the date of this memo, the defense has no photographs of the bullet allegedly found between the girls after it was removed from the ground. No photo or video, for example, shows the bullet as it was being pulled out of the ground. No photo or video of the bullet immediately after it was pulled from the ground. No video or photograph of all sides of the bullet immediately after it was pulled from the ground. No photographs of the bullet next to a measuring device to show its length. No photos that show what the bullet looked like once it was pulled out of the ground could provide proof that it is the same bullet that ended up in the evidence locker room. Shockingly, in his deposition, Sheriff Liggett admitted that he has also not seen any photographs of the purported bullet taken once the bullet was pulled from the ground. In other words, the only photos that the defense has found in the discovery it has received are of the bullet still buried in the ground. At this time, the defense has no idea if A... Photos of the bullet after it was removed from the ground even exist. Or two, the photos exist, but the state has not yet turned over those important photographs over to the defense. Or three, the defense has missed these photos in the voluminous discovery. Either way, the defense has asked the prosecutor to please locate these photographs. So they're they're, they're raising all sorts of issues about... They're focusing a lot on the bullet. On whether or not uh, the recovery of the bullet from the crime scene was properly photographed and documented. And again, they're cover- they're focusing on the bullet a lot because it's a crucial piece of evidence. And if this claim was true, the bullet wasn't discovered until many days later after the crime scene had been released, I would have expected the defense attorneys to make a big deal about it. I, I would be I was- making the biggest deal in the world about it. I feel like that would be my number one thing. The bullet that allegedly ties my client to the scene could have been planted there later on. Yes. That's the headline. Uh, I will say that we first heard this rumor, I think, close to uh, a year ago. And uh, we did our due diligence and we quickly established our satisfaction that this claim, the bullet was actually recovered uh, many days later, was not true. There was absolutely nothing to it. And we didn't say this on the show because, frankly, we... We don't it, need to report on stuff that's not news because it's not true. It's yes, like anti-news. If, 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 we were, if we started coming on the show and listing everything we heard that wasn't true, that would be every episode every day. There'd be so there'd that, be episodes on, like, Bigfoot and stuff. I mean, there's all, so many stupid rumors out there. But when it gets uh, reported and repeated on national news outlets, then the calculus changes somewhat. And you feel like you do have to say something. So this this claim that uh, was made on national television is not true. The bullet was not recovered days later. That's just simply not true. I, I would also suggest that it's worthwhile to go back and look at discussions of the bullet in court documents. Because, again, court documents or where the prosecutor and the defense attorneys are talking to the judge 
and are making an effort to be absolutely truthful in what they say. And let's go all the way back to the PCA, which was the first time we all officially heard about the bullet. And I'm going to read how the bullet was first mentioned in that PCA. There was also a 40 caliber unspent round less than two feet away from victim two's body between victim one and two's bodies. So what they're saying there indicates that they were determining the position of the bullet based upon its proximity to bodies. And if the bullet wasn't found until days later after the bodies had been removed, they wouldn't be saying that. They would be saying it was found near the location of where the bodies were. So it seems pretty clear from even this document that the bullet was found at the same time the bodies were still present at the crime scene. Now, one thing that McDonald's report does get right, seemingly, is the idea that it's buried. Uh, the bullet was buried to some extent. To what extent? What, what exactly that means? I don't know. But that is reflected to me in the Frank's memorandum. But the idea that the scene was cleared and then they came back to it and then found it days later does not seem to be accurate at all. But, of course, naturally, because it's, you know, something attention-grabbing in the Delphi case, it makes the rounds all over the place, regardless of whether it seems true or even likely, frankly. Yeah, and, and again, this claim uh, is simply not true. Yeah, that would be a huge dereliction of duty on the, on the parts of the defense. They would make a big deal about that, because that is a big deal. It's a, it's a huge deal. That's a huge deal. I just don't I just don't understand how some of this stuff gets around, frankly, to this extent. And frankly, it's it's troubling to me. One question we get a lot this is kind of interesting. It has to do with the defense in, of Richard Allen. And a lot of people have reached out to us expect expressing some skepticism about the way that the Odinist theory is laid out by the defense. Note, I'm not saying necessarily the Odinist theory that was laid out by Todd Click. I'm saying that this specific iteration of it, we've had a lot of people say, this doesn't sound realistic, this sounds kind of cobbled together, and there's not a lot of evidence backing it up. There's a lot of kind of conjecture on the part of the defense. And that's that's an opinion. I think other people find it compelling. So there's different opinions. But the people who don't like the Odinist theory ask us, can they hypothetically pivot can they actually say, you know what, this is not the strongest one we can go with. Let's actually say it was Ron Logan. Can they switch at this time? What is the answer to that, Kevin? Sure. They can do whatever they want. Yes, they can switch. You know, when, when you start investigating a case or start defending a case or prosecuting a case, you might have theories or ideas that further investigation will make you determine maybe this wasn't quite right. So if they wish, they can keep the theory as is. If this is the defense that they feel will result in the acquittal of Richard Allen, they can certainly do that. They can fine-tune it. They, say, they can say, well, we were right in the big picture, but maybe we got this little detail or that little detail wrong. They can do that. Or they can, if they wish, they can completely scrap it and come up with something different. I wouldn't be surprised if they brought mental health into it but again. Uh, you know, if they if they... If they expanded, because the theory seems to be uh, cultivated now to get, get around mental health issues by having the guards be the impetus for his alleged incriminating statements. I wouldn't be surprised if they maybe circled around and said, actually, mental health issues are more of a of a in play here than we might otherwise think. So that's just a guess on my part. But it just shows you that it's not locked in stone. It's not it's not set in stone at this point. That being said, I think it would just be from a PR perspective would be a bad move to totally scrap it at this point because it has gotten so much attention unless you had a really good reason to from the public confidence standpoint, that's not going to look very good. Well, it, from the standpoint of people such as ourselves, I would say Anya and I, and certainly everybody listening to this episode would be what I would consider a, a high information person when it comes to the Delphi case. True. 
you you guys all know a lot about the case. We know a lot about the case. And so we would uh, react to the news of a switch in defense strategies in a particular way based on that. But most people wouldn't care. In theory, the jury are the only people whose opinions really matter. And in theory, you will have a jury who is not super aware of any of this. Or even if they have an understanding of the <laughs> basics of the case because they've been, you know, because they're in Indiana, they they might not know all the ins and outs. They're like, oh, the Odinist theory versus the new theory. Like, they, I would I would think that they would not be having jurors who care about that sort of thing. So I'm I'm not convinced they would pay a high price. I don't. I'm not jury. saying they'd pay a high price. I think it would make a lot of people look askance. But that's not really a huge price to pay if if it doesn't matter. Ultimately, what matters is the the opinions and the thoughts and the, and the feelings and the analysis of the twelve jurors who sit on Richard Allen's jury, his peers who are going to be judging this for themselves. It does not matter what some podcasters or what some YouTubers or what some reporters or, or what any of us who are following the case think or say. It's the, it's all, that's it, all noise. That, is that jury going to convict or is that jury going to acquit? Based on what the evidence they hear, based on what the maneuvering and the expert witnesses, what, that's what, that's what it comes down to. But I can also say that just from a PR perspective, uh, the public, the court of public opinion has played a role in this case so far. And my view is that, you know, if, if it's, it would be the same if Nick McClellan suddenly dropped charges against Richard Allen and said, we don't actually think it was him. We think it was this guy that, you know, it would just at this point, altering things to a huge degree would be uh, would, I think, make some people lose confidence in one side or the other, unless there was some very good reason for that for that switch. One question we get a lot is, why do we feel that Richard Allen is incarcerated in prison under the Indiana Department of Correction rather than a jail? And I think that's a different question than what we think should happen. I tend to think Kevin and I, and I don't want to speak for Kevin, so correct me if you feel differently, but I tend to feel both of us would feel more comfortable if he was in a jail close to his lawyers. That just seems like there's a lot of complaints about that and, you know, why not just uh, kind of address that and whatever happens, happens. But when it comes to why do I think he is in prison rather than jail, I think he's I think he is at risk from other inmates in a, in a low security setting. And a jail might be more problematic if, if cells are shared or there's like common spaces where he could be harmed. and It would be more difficult to keep him isolated. And I also think that. It sounds like from the court documents we've read that he has been, in, it, at the very least, intermittently suicidal or, or could be viewed as suicidal. That sort of need for mental health treatment may be complicating where would be feasible for him to be incarcerated. That's sort of what I'm reading into it. I would agree. I would, I would tend to think that, you know, maybe at this point he should still be put in a jail near his lawyers and... and but I can also understand where the concern would be coming from that would be perhaps prompting some of that. So that's where I, I kind of come down the middle on that to a certain extent, even I, though I have an opinion about what yeah, should happen. I agree. We also get asked a lot about depositions. On March 1st, uh, the investigators who worked on the leak investigation are scheduled to be deposed. And of course... As uh, listeners of this program are well aware, Anya and I played a role in that. And so we've gotten asked, do we expect that we will be deposed? And my gut instinct, well, first of all, this case is always full of surprises. Yeah. So any prediction a person makes has to take that into account. But with that said, uh, I would not uh, expect us to be deposed. Yeah, And I say that for a few reasons. First of all, we've been readily transparent on this program about what exactly we did, uh, who we notified about the leak, and all of those details. I, I think what the defense is interested in, or certainly what, if I were the defense attorneys in this case, what I would be interested in 
is not so much what two podcasters did, but rather what did the state do? And the investigators, in some sense, represent the state. They're state actors. How did the state respond to this information? How did they conduct their investigation? How did they choose who would conduct the investigation? What decisions did they make? I, I think there have been uh, some concerns raised by the defense that as a result of this investigation, some communications that the defense believes should have been confidential may have been seen by Prosecutor McClelland or others. So I imagine they would also want information about that. Uh, how did that happen? Do you feel that this is a violation of some sort of confidentiality? I think that is, if I was the defense, those are the sorts of issues I would be concerned with. Well, also by having a lot of lawyers come in as witnesses, defense lawyers, they seem to be at least maybe telegraphing a little bit, and I may be getting the wrong idea, but telegraphing a bit about people who can come in and say, this isn't really contempt of court and here's why. Kind of a Westerman defense of like, something can be bad, but not against the rules or the law. And so I would imagine they might be going for that as well. Digging into the facts, but also maybe relying on some of those interpretations to bolster their points. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, anything could happen at this point, though. I think that's my that's my attitude with Delphi. Who knows? Sometimes people ask us versions of this question. Sometimes it focuses on different players. But do we feel that either Judge Gull, the prosecution, or the defense has botched this case? That the case is botched by one, two, or all parties? And, uh, you know, should we just throw it all out? Yeah, and I guess botched in this context means, what, wrecked beyond salvation? Wrecked beyond salvation. I guess if you're looking at it from, from Judge Gull being the perpetrator, has she made it so that there's no fair trial? With the prosecution, have they bungled the investigation? Have they bungled the case and it can't be prosecuted? With the defense, have they sowed so much confusion and chaos with the leak that they have essentially... You know, maybe maybe harm their client or maybe actually set him up for an automatic appeal that will benefit him. But in a way that's kind of I think a lot of people would find sketchy and unfair that that's a question that we get asked a lot. Like, what are the big implications? And I, I kind of feel like that's a reasonable question. There's been a lot of chaos. I don't think that's good. Do I feel like any side has botched it or or kind of made it so that they can never win or that things can't go decently from here on. At this state, I don't feel that. Maybe that's overly optimistic or naive. But with Judge Gull, I mean, with Judge Gull and the defense, both of them sort of got a clean bill of health to a certain extent from the Indiana Supreme Court. The Indiana Supreme Court stepped in and said that what the defense did did not merit them being thrown off. They should be put back on. So if they're saying that, then they're kind of getting the buy-in from the top court in the land. So, like, there you go. Same with Judge Gull. They're saying she was right to act decisively. She didn't have the context that we did. And we feel she reached for the wrong button to push. And so we're undoing that. But she was correct to take this seriously and basically take some action. So they're not saying, you know, we find that she's completely biased and, and kicking them off and having a statement ready to kick them off and wanting to have cameras. They're, they didn't really seem to care about any of that. They just were saying, like, just undo it and then move on. So when it comes to the defense and the judge, I don't know. I think the Indiana Supreme Court's decision is something that I look at as, like, if they don't feel that either side was so toxic or, or disastrous that they should have been kicked off, then... I mean, I don't know why I should necessarily feel that way. And then for the prosecution, a lot of the recent legal wranglings so far have not really had to do with Nick McClellan's actions, although things could go that way depending on how things play out regarding him seeing information between Westerman and Baldwin that may play a part in Richard Allen's defense. Like, I guess we'll have to, well, I think we'll have to see what happens with that, but I feel like there have been definitely mistakes outlined by law enforcement and, the, you know, and, and, and whatnot with this investigation. But I think one thing people don't really realize is that there's sort of a lot of mistakes that happen in every investigation. And it's the defense's job to 
hammer those and try to sway a jury with them. And it's the prosecution's job to kind of keep going. So nothing I've seen has made me be like, oh, this is unwinnable on on either side. Well said. What do you think? I, I agree with you. What you said was very well said. Yeah, so uh, I, I share your, your views on this. And I'm confident that uh, Richard Allen can still receive the fair trial to which he's entitled. I concur. I don't think everyone... I, the, 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 my biggest concern with him having a fair trial at this point... Because, I mean, again, like Judge Gull, from the view of the Indiana Supreme Court, she acted on his behalf. She felt his lawyers were incompetent, so she wasn't doing it to like mess him up. But to me, what would mess him up is the intense pretrial media coverage. And that being said... There are a lot of people, and we talk to them, who don't know anything about this case in Indiana. That's not the impression people get when they're part of the true crime community and they're talking and thinking about this constantly and they're meeting other people who share their interests. But there's that's a bubble. It's very much a bubble. It's not everybody in Indiana. You might be hard-pressed to get somebody who's never, ever heard of the case at all, but I don't think you'd be that hard. I don't think you'd be as hard-pressed as you think to get somebody who really doesn't know much about it. Maybe maybe they've heard Delphi murders, but maybe they know that two girls were murdered, but I don't they might not know anything else cuz we've definitely talked to people like that as well as people who've just actually never heard of it. Yeah, people generally once you get out of the true crime bubble, there's a lot of people who just for whatever reason don't pay much attention. It's really depressing and dark and some people just don't really want to be thinking about that constantly and I I think that's understandable. It's not like they're ignorant or stupid for not knowing about it. It's just that that's not the sort of thing they tend to gravitate towards. Yeah, it's it's a silly comparison, but there's a lot of people who might follow their city sports team or something like that, but you wouldn't have any trouble finding people who are just generally aware of how the team is doing, uh, people who have no idea how the team is doing, people who know every detail of the payroll and who's going to be traded for who we we talk a lot i think you know in in the media it gets talked a lot about the fact that we all get into political echo chambers when we're only in via social media and via the internet we're only hearing opinions that we agree with and it's the the algorithms sort of cultivate us to hear more of what we like and not necessarily what we don't like and so that kind of makes people more extreme but the same can be said for just interests so if you like true crime, you know, Google's and, and Facebook are giving you ads for other podcasts and other shows and watch this, read this. But that can also be true for people who are not into true crime and are just into other things. They're not necessarily seeing that. And so my, my biggest concern would be that he gets a jury that would be problematic because they are self-appointed experts on the case, I think. But I, I the more I think about it and the more I just talk to people, the the less I'm super concerned about that as long as everybody does their jobs during voir dire and you know ensures that the jury is is fair and impartial before we go why don't we quickly answer one more question we often get which is what's happening with the kagan klein case yes of course he pled guilty and was sentenced but that's not the end of a case in our criminal justice system Typically, there are appeals, even in situations where somebody has pled guilty. Yes. And Kagan Klein was actually sentenced to 43 years. That certainly seems to some like an unusually long sentence. And so he is appealing that. He's trying to argue that his sentence is unduly harsh for what he did. And his attorney filed a brief and uh, a couple of the most salient arguments in that were the sentence was too harsh. You you may remember that uh, a big topic of discussion in the Kagan Klein sentencing procedure was which of these charges count as separate criminal episodes and which can be grouped into the same criminal episode. Shoplifting is a good example, right? If I am shoplifting, and let, let's say there's no... Let's say I'm under whatever dollar amount it takes to make you know a difference either way. But if I take three boxes of cereal, are they going to charge me for each box of cereal if it's a one-time thing? Or now here's where it becomes complicated. What if I go back three times that day in separate 
shopping incidents and and st- steal the same box of cereal from that store. What if Anya steals a box of cereal today? Six months from now, she gets hungry again, goes back to the store, steals another box. A year later, she goes and steals a third box. I think we'd all agree Anya is guilty of three different criminal episodes. Yes. Thanks, guys. But if Anya steals three boxes of cereal on the same occasion, is that three separate episodes or is that one episode? That's important because the higher the number of criminal episodes you have, the higher the overall sentence can be. That's that's true. There's so, also a lot of discussion about concurrent versus consecutive sentences. That's about whether or not you're serving time for different charges at the same time. So concurrent. It's consecutive. It's like laid end to end and you end up you know, serving more time. So Kagan's attorney argued that The judge separated these charges into too many criminal episodes. They should be separated into fewer criminal episodes so that Kagan would get a smaller sentence. And the defense attorney further argued that the judge, when a judge hands down a sentence, he's allowed a certain amount of discretion in order to make the sentence a little bit more towards the harsh side or a little bit more towards the lenient side. And it's written into law that he can consider certain things to be mitigating factors, certain things to be aggravating factors. And if something's an aggravating factor, that makes it worse. And so the sentence can be longer. And if something's a mitigating factor, that's something that makes it better. Uh, So the sentence can actually be a bit shorter. And Kagan's defense attorney argued that some of the things that the judge considered as aggravating factors were not allowed to be considered as aggravating factors by statute. So, actually, earlier this week, the the state of Indiana actually responded to those arguments in uh, a pretty well-done brief. It actually goes into a great amount of detail. It really goes into the weeds on some of these criminal charges that Kagan pled guilty to. And it makes the argument that, no, the judge actually was well within his discretion to group them into the criminal episodes that he did. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they're arguing this doesn't need to change. The sentence does not need to have years knocked off. And then in terms of aggravating versus mitigating factors... They argue that the things that the defense attorney says Judge Timothy Spark considered as aggravating factors inappropriately, he actually, according to a transcript of his remarks, he didn't really consider those as aggravating factors. So he just, he cited them, but he wasn't saying, this is why, this is an aggravating factor. Yes, and I I think that's a point we may have mentioned when we discussed... uh, the defense attorney's brief earlier. You kind of have to, yeah, I mean, it's understandable why the defense attorney is going for this. I think you have to try. And they're doing their jobs. Their job is to advocate for King Klein. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a terribly compelling argument at the end of the day. I think Judge Spar seemed to consider this very, very thoughtfully. I thought that the Miami County Prosecutor's Office considered a lot of this very thoughtfully. I felt like Jen Kiefer, Courtney Alwine did an excellent job putting together this case against him in a way that it was very devastating to Kagan and Klein. And I think that if that this holds, then maybe other um, prosecutor's offices in Indiana that want to get serious about incorrigible, consistently incorrigible sex, sexual offenders who are targeting kids online should look to this case as a way to put people away for a long time. Because when there's something like that and and rehabilitation doesn't necessarily seem in order, then this is a this is a way of removing them from society so they're not harming children. I didn't really go into much detail here in, in, as to how this brief argues about grouping the charges into particular criminal episodes. That detail is in the brief itself. As I say, I found it to be pretty well done. One reason I didn't go into it is because some of those details are not 
particularly pleasant to read about or discuss, but we will certainly make that brief uh, available in our Facebook group. And it's okay if you don't want to read it because it does include some details about uh, child sexual abuse materials that are not pleasant reading. No, but it's. I think it's important that we we note that what Kagan was charged with and what he pled guilty to are, are incredibly serious, incredibly serious crimes. And sometimes when you read about sexual crimes against children, you, you, you come away thinking, like, why did this guy get so little time in prison for this? Like, this is so much more serious than, like, a drug offense where no one gets hurt. But sometimes you feel like you're reading about, like, nonviolent drug offenses where no one died and they're going away to prison for longer. And it seems sort of bizarre. But I think in this case, certainly, certainly, I'll, I'll never forget that day in the courtroom. And it was actually pretty much a full day and beyond in the courtroom when Kagan Klein was sentenced. Prosecutors Courtney Allwine and Jennifer Kiefer presented an array of witnesses who went into horrifying detail about the nature of Kagan Klein's offenses the nature of the things he pled guilty to. And I I don't imagine that anyone who spent all those hours in the courtroom that day and heard all of those awful, awful, awful details, I don't think anyone would have qualms about him being sentenced to prison for 43 years. No, I just also, I mean, one thing that came up with Kagan in particular, and this is, I'm very much, I believe in rehabilitation. I, I want to see people who have done wrong and have been convicted of crimes rehabilitated in many cases. We've had on people who were once inmates at prisons who have, you know, they're not bad people. They made mistakes and now they're living their lives. And I think that's wonderful. But when someone, when someone doesn't really show remorse and in fact continues to engage with other people in a way that I think could be described as predatory, even though it was with adults rather than children. It's hard to see room for rehabilitation if the person doesn't seem to care about changing. And they actually go into this in in this brief. They talk about how at different times Kagan has described certain events as a wake up call that's made him change his behavior, but that his behavior never really seemed to change And certainly even after he was incarcerated and was waiting for the disposition of these charges, he continued to have sexually explicit conversations with women on the outside whom he would manipulate into doing things for his gratification. Doesn't show somebody who's had a wake-up call. And I'm going to say this, I mean, on some level, I, I feel very sorry for Kagan. I feel sorry for the child he once was who was raised in an abusive, physically abusive household where his father, Tony Klein, was, you know, beating his mother, beating his step-siblings, his half-siblings. And uh, just what a what a horrifying, dysfunctional situation. You know, even if one is not receiving the abuse, the physical abuse directly, that is, that is not an appropriate, that, that is a horrifying situation for just a child to witness. But Kagan, when he was doing this was an adult. He made these choices. He chose to victimize children. And some of their stories that came out during this whole process were, were so gutting to hear about what what he did with them and, and how he manipulated and harmed them. And those children that he did this to, that he catfished and then um, manipulated into giving him sexually explicit photos, oftentimes when they're at a very vulnerable state in their lives, that's going to stay with them. And I, I hope that they find healing and accept that they're the victims in this situation. This What happened was his fault, not theirs. But, you know, he, he has to he has to live with that and that that those are choices he made as an adult. And so at the end of the day, that coupled with the lack of remorse and the kind of continued appalling behavior behind the scenes, it just... I think there's there's limits in certain situations when something seems so compulsive to, I think, the amount of, uh, you know, like, I, I really believe that people have to want to be rehabilitated. That's well said. I think that's a good place to end. Thank you all for listening. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. 
If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. You've worked hard to build your brand, so why settle for one-size-fits-all branded clothing? Lands and Outfitters creates apparel your employees will truly want to wear, all backed by above and beyond expertise. See why Lands and Outfitters has been a branded apparel supplier to some of the world's most respected brands for more than 30 years. Go to business.landsend.com slash pod20 and use code pod20 for 20% off your first product. That's business.landsend.com slash pod20, code pod20 for 20% off your first product.